Good morning, everyone. I think we'll get started again now. Welcome, welcome back uh, to our session that's called Coastal Communities. Uh, we have two speakers and no discussant, <laughs> at least not so far, any discussant, um, which will just leave us more time for discussion. I'm still going to hold the two speakers to 20 minutes, the same, the same format as yesterday. Uh, I think there's plenty that we can talk about, so, so uh, um, anyway, that's the plan. The boss says we can have until 1045 for this session, so, so that is what we'll do. Let me just introduce really quickly the two speakers. I think if you picked up the blurbs on everybody out there, you have more detail. Um, but we'll go in the order on the program. First is Mike uh, Moscolino, uh, who is in the history department at Georgetown. He's a Berkeley alum undergraduate Berkeley alum and uh, Harvard PhD. And uh, there's his title, so I won't tell you that. Our other speaker will be Michael Sony in the East Asian Language and Civilization Department at Harvard, uh, BA from University of Toronto, not Berkeley. But since I told you Micah's, I thought I'd tell you his too. <laughs> and the Berkeley of the North. The Berkeley of the North, exactly. <laughs> That's just what I was thinking. Uh, and uh, he has a DPhil from Oxford, which is the uh, Harvard of the East or something. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, w with no more screwing around here, <laughs> Micah, it's your turn. That's a very tough, inter that's a very tough introduction to follow. I, I, I'm afraid I can't be as funny as Rob, but um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go ahead and read. Um, since 2008, an array of direct links between Taiwan and China have come into existence, as our speakers yesterday discussed in some detail. After six decades without legal direct travel or trade, the opening of connections between Taiwan and China was heralded as a huge breakthrough in cross-strait relations. But what I discuss in this paper is the fact that direct links actually existed long before 2008, as goods and people flowed across the straits on an underground basis. So even before martial law came to an end and Taiwan tourists and other visitors could go to the mainland in 1987, people from China and Taiwan engaged in exchanges through a complex web of smuggling networks, and that's what I describe in this paper. Um, and, so, and obviously, this is nothing new from a historian's perspective. Um, since pre-modern times, Taiwan and the Southeast Coast have been part of what's usually referred to as maritime China, a dynamic commercial world composed of fishers and seaborne merchants. Uh, this goes back to the Han Dynasty, um, according to historians who study these things, and certainly by later periods, it was a flourishing uh, maritime realm. So the fundamental features of this maritime sphere form a bond between Taiwan and areas on the southeast coast, particularly Fujian. Coastal residents of Taiwan and Fujian depend on a common marine environment, exploiting the same fisheries and navigating the same waterways. On the sociocultural level, of course, shared language and desire for goods from across the strait ease the wheels of trade. These networks in which mobility and the pursuit of profit reign supreme defy efforts by regimes in Taiwan and China to subject them to fixity and control. Despite long periods of political separation, maritime trade has formed an enduring link across the strait. Below the high-level Cold War, as it's often referred to between China and Taiwan, commercial exchanges and person-to-person interactions occurred outside the realm of state-defined legitimacy. So focusing on the period between the mid-1970s through the mid-early 1990s, my goal is to map networks of fishermen and smugglers that span the Taiwan Strait. So if we turn the clock back to the 1950s all the way up until the um, mid-late 1970s, there was actually little direct cross-strait trade and travel. The favored route for smuggling goods from mainland China into Taiwan was to go through Hong Kong. So actually, even though there wasn't a lot of a cross -strait, direct cross-strait interaction, there was always a pretty reliable supply of mainland goods in Taiwan because they were just shipped through Hong Kong. 
Um, this indirect trade gave merchants and consumers in Taiwan a steady supply of mainland products. Um, but it was in the 1970s when military tensions between the ROC and PRC eased that direct cross-strait trade began to coalesce. So in the mid-1970s, China began to welcome Taiwanese fishermen as a way of promoting cross-strait contact and eventual unification. The PRC opened up reception centers for fishing boats uh, from Taiwan where they could find shelter uh, from typhoons, repair their engines, obtain provisions, and observe life in China. The PR PRC's initiatives uh, actually ended up redefining the terms of cross-strait interactions, opening up avenues for direct contacts that the P ROC deemed illegal. So taking advantage of the PRC's new stance, from the mid-1970s, fishing boats from both sides of the straits began to trade at sea. Initially, the trade was centered on Guangdong, um, but when the PRC moved to stop smuggling uh, in that region of South China, in the late 1970s, boats moved north to Fujian, where the, the anti-smuggling patrols weren't as strict. So from around 1979, there are myriad reports of a smuggling boom in Fujian. Uh, drawn in by opportunities for profit, local cadres and law enforcement in Fujian lent their protection and support to the cross-strait trade. Um, and so this was something that involved local officials smugglers, fishermen, all kind of working together. So what were they trading? Well, Chinese fishing boats really liked a number of things from Taiwan, wrist, wrist watches, calculators, batteries, TVs, radios, cassette decks, and then later on, slightly later on, VCRs from Taiwan. Um, the mainlanders especially loved the tapes of Deng Li Jun or Teresa Deng, the famous pop singer, um, which were not readily available in, in the mainland at the time. Also popular were plastic rain gear, lighters, copies of Playboy magazine, and other things that were not readily, readily available on the mainland. So Chinese fishing boats initially traded for these products with gold, mostly in the form of jewelry, silver in the form of silver dollars, other types of jewelry, or even British pound sterling that had been left over from the pre-1949 years, jade, antique ceramics, furniture, and medicinal ingredients, um, especially ginseng. That was the, the top one because Dongbei ginseng is the best, and you can't really grow good ginseng in Taiwan, so um, that was a huge, huge import for Taiwan. So how did this trade work? Well, Fishers and smugglers devised informal institutions to negotiate these economic exchanges. Um, and so I think this is one of these instances where people are building up some level of trust, right? If this trade is going to go on, people need to know the terms of trade, how many watches for one chunk of gold or whatever. So people were able to negotiate these terms of exchange without any kind of real state oversight that spanned the straits. Um, of course, they didn't always go smoothly, right? Um, accusations of swindling sometimes led to fights and confrontations. Um, Taiwanese passed off fake Rolexes as genuine articles. Uh, some mainland Chinese tried to make purchases with lead bars coated in gold leaf. There's all kinds of disputes about these things. Um, and when those disputes broke out, people would negotiate settlements and sort of come up with ways of carrying out trade um, as before. By 1981, the sources indicate that the trade between fishing boats had inflated gold prices and led to silver shortages in China's coastal regions. Um, and as gold and silver supplies grew more scarce, smugglers turned to Hong Kong, US, and even, eventually even Taiwan dollars to do this trade. But actually, barter still predominated. Um, Taiwanese fishermen would exchange their wares for mainland Chinese goods. So what did the higher levels of government, aside from these local cadres in Fujian that I mentioned before, think about this trade? Well, their stances were rather different. For the ROC, all direct cross-strait exchanges was banned. Uh, the PRC, on the other hand, defined the exchanges as legitimate trade within China's borders as long as the boats came to port and sold through state-sanctioned channels. One of the big concerns was this private trading of gold and foreign currencies that I mentioned before. 
Um, it was smuggling, according to the central leadership of the PRC, if boats evaded official control, unloading tax-free goods for sale elsewhere, or made unauthorized transactions in precious metals, currency, or exchange certificates. But even based on China's rather lenient definition, illicit trade was on the rise in the early 1980s. So in 1980 and 1981, the PRC launched a series of campaigns to wipe out smuggling, um, especially trade between fishing boats on the high seas. But as soon as the campaigns eased up, boats from Fujian and other coastal provinces quickly resumed this underground trade with Taiwan. Now, for Taiwan, this kind of cross-strait trade between fishing boats was actually a, a particularly vexed question legally because anti-smuggling regulations punished illegal import and export of goods. But as Shelley Riggers' talk yesterday you know, really drew out, the question of the inside, the China inside, the China outside, um, made this very complicated because whether or not trade between Taiwan and China crossed national borders was very much in dispute. So if not, transporting goods from the mainland couldn't be called smuggling because it wasn't crossing national borders, right? If it's all the same country, you're not crossing any national border. Um, after much debate in 1985, the legislative, late, legislative UN actually passed anti-smuggling regulations that made trade with mainland Chinese fishing boats punishable by a maximum jail sentence of seven years. Um, so there's actually a move in the mid 80s to sort of crack down on this trade. But even with the stringency of these custom regulations, smugglers from Taiwan still went to Fujian on a regular basis. So as illicit trade flourished in the early 1980s, Ping Tan Island, conveniently located 73 miles from Taiwan, rose to prominence as Fujian's main smuggling center. cross strait encounters expanded in 1978 with the opening of the Ping Tan Fisherman Reception Center. Um, other Taiwanese who were not actual fishing men, fishermen, or uh, they hitched rides on boats, uh, making the 11 hour ride to Ping Tan from Shinju to do business, to see their relatives, just to do you know, whatever they wanted. Um, officials in Ping Tan, of course, knew what was going on. They welcomed Taiwanese visitors um, to visit and to engage in trade. The reception center arranged for Taiwanese to get whatever products they wanted from local, local suppliers. In 1981 and 1983, uh, Fujian actually opened state licensed companies to specialize in small scale trade with Taiwan. Department stores in Pingtan had special counters to sell cassette recorders, watches, umbrellas, all kinds of other things from Taiwan. Um, according to sources from the 80s, about 80% of the fishing boats in Pingtan had taken part in this smuggling, and it was pretty much a agreed upon that Pingtan's entire economy depended on this trade with Taiwan. Um, in the late 1980s, fishermen from Pingtan and other ports in Fujian also found employment on Taiwanese fishing boats. Um, hiring these crew members from the mainland was a way of dealing with a shortage of labor in uh, Taiwan. And mainland China's coastal areas had labor surpluses um, for a variety of reasons. Most importantly, because China's most economically important fish stocks had declined due to decades of overfishing, causing production to drop and leaving many coastal residents unemployed. So um, some of these unemployed fishermen in the mainland turned to smuggling. Others found jobs on Taiwanese fishing boats. Um, but despite earning relatively high wages, of course, Fujian fishermen endured dangerous work conditions and mistreatment by Taiwanese fishing boat captains. This is something that Sarah Friedman has talked about in her um, ethnography of uh, county and coastal Fujian. Um, so that's the situation in Pingtan. But that island off the Fujian coast had its counterpart across the strait in just 80 miles away in Xinju's fishing port of Nanliao, which in the late 1980s was the center for Taiwan's illegal trade with China. Um, Nanliao residents previously made their living from fishing, but after martial law ended in 1987, smuggling got much easier. Households jumped at the opportunity to exchange consumer items from Taiwan for fish and agricultural products. Initially, all of the transactions took place at sea, but as hostilities between Taiwan and the PRC subsided, boats from Nanliao jumped at the opportunity to go to mainland ports. By the end of the 1980s, practically all the boats from Nanliao had gone to China. 
this upsurge in smuggling coincided with the decline of Taiwan's nearshore fishery resources. So the situation in the marine environment is sort of forging a connection here. In the 1980s, fishing grounds off Taiwan declined due to pollution and overfishing, making it very difficult to bring in a large enough catch to recover expenses. So when stocks collapsed, smuggling was a very profitable uh, alternative. Um, at this same time, China's aquaculture industry was undergoing rapid development. So many fishing boats from Nanliao gave up catching fish and instead smuggled fish back from the mainland where it was artificially raised um, to sell in Taiwan. Unable to compete with China's low production costs, Taiwan entrepreneurs instead invested in refrigeration and um, aquaculture enterprises, shipping this farm-raised farm -raised marine products back to Taiwan. A survey conducted in June 1990 stated that more than half the fish sold in northern Taiwan actually came from the mainland. Supplies from China kept prices low, but falling prices depressed the income of legitimate fishing enterprises, making smuggling even more attractive. So in the late 80s, fishermen in Nanliao who actually fished made about um, 10,000 Taiwan dollars a year. Those who smuggled made about 500,000 Taiwan dollars a year. So it's much, much more lucrative to smuggle. So along with fish, Nanliao's fishing fleet also transported less savory items like guns, drugs, and also people uh, from China to Taiwan. And as these illicit transactions gained attention in Taiwan's media in the late 80s, smuggling came under heavy criticism as a source of crime. These concern, concerns motivated the ROC to embark on its first major anti-smuggling campaign in 1990, sending troops into Nanliao to impose curfews and crack down on the smuggling trade. Um, but it had, very, it had a very difficult time bringing this trade to an end. Fishing boats either moved to different ports or just used smaller, more uh, maneuverable boats to evade these anti-smuggling controls. And of course, once the crackdown passed, illicit trade with Taiwan picked up again, or with the mainland picked up again and went on unabated. So a particularly difficult issue for Taiwan was stopping flows of illegal migrants from mainland China. Normally, people from the mainland paid a fishing boat or professional smuggler to take them across the strait, but it was actually very easy for them to recoup those expenses after a few months of working in Taiwan. Between 1987 and the end of 1992, the ROC detained over 21,000 mainland Chinese trying to enter Taiwan illegally, and over 19,000 were returned to the mainland. Numbers peaked in 1992 and 1993 when law enforcement apprehended 5,000 illegal immigrants per year. Almost 98% were Fujian natives, nearly half came from Pingtan, uh, where some 90% of the boats transporting migrants actually originated. So the challenge, once again, for Taiwan was how to handle these immigrants from the, RO, the, from the mainland if the ROC claims sovereignty over all of China, right? They're not illegal immigrants if it's the same country. Uh, the ROC regarded immigrants from Taiwan as traveling between provinces, but the contradiction was that they still forbid them from entering Taiwan. Despite its political sensitivity, this issue of illegal migrants led to the first semi-official agreement between the PRC and Taiwan in 1990, when Red Cross officials from the ROC and PRC met on Jinmen and signed an agreement spelling out procedures for repatriating illegal immigrants and criminal suspects. This was actually how they were repatriated originally. In the late 80s, the policy was to use the same fishing boat or actually, and then later to wait until 50 my immigrants from the mainland had been apprehended, put them on a fishing boat, and then send them back on the boat. This boat crashed just a, uh, a short while after this picture was taken. People were killed and injured. This led to a huge controversy over human rights and how these people were being treated when they were sent back. So the agreement on Jean Men was a way of coping with this controversy. And there they are. Uh, so in line with these G what the Gene Men Accords, the ROC Red Cross sent the names of illegal migrants to the PRC Red Cross, which sent boats to pick these individuals up from the Taiwan counterpart. Um, and so there was sort of oversight on both sides so that there wouldn't be those kinds of accidents anymore. Mainlanders who were awaiting repatriation, okay, um, 
had to live under very harsh conditions in detention facilities set up in Shinju and Ilan. Um, and this is a picture, oh, okay, good, it didn't get too washed out, of, basically it's a jail. I mean, it's, and so then there was also a lot of controversy about the treatment of detainees in these facilities. Um, it, it, it was something that came under pretty harsh criticism again. So a few rep repatriations did take place, but again, this was another one of these issues that um, was a sticking point. But stopping this cross-strait smuggling and piracy was an even bigger challenge since in the 1990s, no contact existed between the PRC and ROC law enforcement. Smugglers could manipulate contested sovereignty and legal jurisdiction to their advantage, giving rise to numerous cross-strait disputes. Um, my paper actually spells out a number of these in some detail, probably too much detail because I'm a historian and that's what we do. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm just gonna describe one that was particularly significant in the interest of time. So in July of 1991, um, a boat from Kaohsiung called the Sanxinsai um, cut between two boats from Fujian that were fishing off of Miaoli. Um, and the boats got their nets all tangled up as fishing boats often do. Uh, the Fujian fishermen caught the Sanxinsai and took its equipment as compensation, right? Um, other fishing boats intervened and mediated a settlement and the Sanxin Sai agreed to pay for the damages. The Fujian fishermen gave back the equipment that they had seized, you know, sort of on their own, and it seemed like everything was okay. But an hour later, ROC naval patrols sent a destroyer and a helicopter to apprehend the two boats from Fujian, um, which were suspected of piracy, and ended up shooting one of the fishermen from Fujian. Um, the ROC naval patrols took the boats and their crews back to Taichung, where the police held them on suspicion of extortion and piracy. The PRC maintained that the altercation was just a fishing dispute and that the ROC had overreacted, indicting the um, capture of these fishermen from Fujian as false charges against innocence. On behalf of the Mainland Affairs Council, Ma ying agree argued that the incident was more than just a civil dispute and because court proceedings were underway, it was better to wait for a decision. The MAC, Mind Joe added would, quote, never accept the mainland's charges that we are implicating good citizens and accusing them of being pirates, end of quote. In August, the ROC eventually agreed to let PRC Red Cross representatives in Taiwan to visit the fishermen. Two Chinese news uh, reporters came as well, the first visit by PRC journalists to Taiwan. Taiwan eventually sent the boats and 11 of their crew members back to China in August, but sentenced five fishermen to 14 months in prison. So, um, yeah, I'll go fast then. So these semi-official dialogues culminated in April 1993 with the meeting between Ku Junfu and the head of Taiwan's uh, Straits Exchange Foundation and Wang Daohan, the head of the PRC's ARATS. Foremost among the topics for discussion were repatriation of illegal immigrants, suppressing marine smuggling and robbery, marine fishing disputes, and these kind of problems that I've been dis discussing um, in this talk. S limited progress was made on these fronts, but due to the breakdown of cross-strait relations for po political and military reasons in mid-1995, no substantive agreements materialized until much later. So to sum up, smuggling did not actually link Taiwan to a coherent unified entity called China. This is something that uh, Rob Weller's talk yesterday emphasized, and I think it comes out quite clearly in this example as well. Rather, contacts coalesced at well-established nodes of maritime trade on the southeast coast. Interactions with the same marine environment, shared language, appreciation of commodities from across the strait, and other linkages formed durable ties between seafarers from Taiwan and Fujian. When hostilities eased in the 1970s and 1980s, the distinctive characteristics of what might be called the Mintai culture, um, that is a regional culture, facilitated revival of commerce and marine environmental change, as I've already tried to show, intensified those interactions. 
State attitudes towards the illicit cross trade exchanges show considerable variation. The PRC encouraged small scale trade with Taiwan to foster cross trade integration and push towards eventual unification. From the outset, local governments in Fujian promoted direct trade with Taiwan to generate revenues. And I think it's pretty clear that local authorities in Nanliao uh, were sort of complicit in this trade as well. The PRC central government was more ambivalent, endeavoring to supervise and control cross-strait trade by limiting it to sanctioned channels. Without any state-sanctioned framework to oversee this direct cross-strait trade, the trust required to capitalize on these economic opportunities grew out of direct personal contacts. Smugglers from China and Taiwan minimized uncertainty by agreeing upon medias of exchange and negotiating inf informal dispute settlements. Um, under most circumstances, they worked pretty well. Trade was able to go on, um, and people were able to sort of have enough trust in their counterparts to, for these things to function. Despite periodic instances of conflict, mutually advantageous transactions were the norm. But I think it's also worth emphasizing, and this is a recurring theme in all of the papers so far, is that these contacts between China and ta Taiwan were not commensurate with cross-strait unification, right? Indeed, profits from smuggling actually depended upon the tensions in cross-strait relations that impeded the opening up of legitimate trade contacts. Local deviation from restrictive central policies was actually what si stimulated these economic ties. Tightening restrictions made commerce more lucrative, while liberating cro liberalizing cross-strait trade threatened to do away with smuggling as a source of wealth. So this is actually very clear in a lot of places in Fujian that used to thrive off of this smuggling trade, most notably a place called Shushur, um, municipality, which is just south of Pingtan. Um, it used to be this bustling hub of trade. Now, it's, there's nothing there because it's so easy to engage in cross-strait trade through legitimate channels um, that smuggling it has really um, decreased in importance. So participants in this underground trade clearly benefited from reductions in cross-strait political hostilities that made transactions le less risky, but full-scale integration, which would have eliminated opportunities for profit, was not in their interest. So it's actually rather complicated to think about how different groups of people have a vested interest in improving cross-strait ties to a point, but if they get too good, then people will lose their special advantageous position and their sort of opportunities just dry up. And this, I think, will come across very clearly in Professor Sony's talk. So. Well, so, I guess our, our chapters are going to have to follow one another in the book, because that's exactly the point I want to make. Um, So one of the, one of the um, ideas associated with this notion of mobile horizons, as Shelley first articulated it, was that, that uh, mobile horizons captured the, the idea of shifting frontiers of possibility, that things that had seemed impossible in the cross-straits relationship suddenly seemed possible. Um, there's another sense, which is that, uh, and that's the sense I'm going to talk about in my paper, which is that places which uh, had seemed far away uh, very quickly seemed, could, could seem much closer. And places that had seemed close uh, could suddenly become far away. Um, the uh, example, um, uh, the outstanding example of this, I think, is, is, is uh, uh, Jinmen. Um, before 1949, uh, Jinmen was very close to mainland Fujian. Uh, it was uh, closely connected economically, socially, culturally, linguistically, in, in really every way. And suddenly after 1949, um, Jinmen became very, very far from the mainland uh, and very, very close to Taiwan, closer than it had ever been. Uh, of course, the, the physical distance didn't change. Uh, 
one of the big challenges for the people of Jinmen over the last 20 years has been that since about the mid-1980s, uh, Jinmen has again moved very close to the mainland and is now much farther away uh, from Taiwan than it used to be. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, this is, this is a scene uh, that is intended to capture the extraordinary distance uh, between the two places in the 1950s and 60s. These are the, the dueling signs um, facing one another across the, the narrow stretch of water. Um, and here, uh, I think, is a nice example of, of, mo of, of, of really mobile horizons. This is the view of the developing Xiamen um, skyline from uh, a bunker on Jinmen. Professor Ye yesterday described the overall orientation of, of this project as uh, an inquiry into um, everyday life under circumstances of cross-straits tension. Uh, in my, in my, my book, uh, Cold War Island, is really about that, uh, and it takes the story up to about 1990. And what I'm hoping to do in, in, in my paper for this book, or the chapter for this book, is to carry the story forward up to the present day. What I want to do today is talk a little bit about approaches uh, and ask the question, what are, um, as she follows nicely from Micah, um, what, are, what are the intellectual payoffs? What's the benefit from uh, distinguishing the larger structure of cross-straits relations, that is the political relationship between the two sides, from the cross-straits interactions in which individuals and groups engage? And the basic argument that the paper makes is that these uh, patterns of interaction are the product of individual and communal interests, uh, decisions that are motivated by interests, claims of identity, identity, and so on, but are distinctive, uh, clearly distinctive, from positions on larger issues of an overall cross-strait settlement. And a, and a resolution of cross-straits tension. So to make that argument, what, I've, what, I, what, I'll, what I'll do very, very quickly is talk about the history of Jinmen since 1949 uh, in terms of three phases. Um, the first phase, what Micah called the high-level Cold War, uh, lasting from 1949, we can actually date it precisely to the Battle of Gudingtou in October 1949, up to about the mid-1980s. And during this period, the larger cross-straits relationship, the tension across the straits, really defined life on Jinmen, uh, shaping uh, a, a just a huge range of, uh, an, an almost uh, uh, unlimited range of elements of, of human experience. Uh, it shaped labor patterns in the form of, of uh, universal conscription into uh, um, uh, militia. Uh, it shaped the economy, it shaped local politics, uh, it shaped uh, the local uh, gender order, um, uh, the, uh, the um, stationing of tens of thousands, perhaps more than 100,000 uh, soldiers on Jinmen had profound consequences for the local marriage market. Uh, it even shaped um, uh, the local religious order. Uh, shrines to patriotic generals, Ai uh, Jun, uh, the dead uh, soldiers, both from the mainland, uh, from the the, CC, the PR, the PLA, and the ROC Army, uh, are all over uh, the island, as uh, uh, Rob Student Chi Chang Wei has written about. Um, but there was a really almost no interaction across the straits. That is to say, cross the larger cross straits relationship shaped people's lives. But the kinds of flows of goods and people and, and ideas was, was effectively cut off. One interesting exception, which I think I will have to work in the paper, was fishermen. Uh, local fishermen were um, basically uh, forced to do intelligence collecting, uh, propagandizing, and then they did a lot of smuggling as well. But this is a period when there is uh, 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 the cross-straits relationship defines virtually every dimension of life but at the same time, there's almost no cross-strait interaction. This begins to change for reasons that came up uh, yesterday uh, in the 1980s. Um, and what happens on Jinmen in the 1980s, uh, late 1980s, uh, democratization and the end of martial law on Jinmen is a few years behind Taiwan. It, it's, it's, uh, uh, martial law isn't lifted until 92. 
um, is in a sense that the cross-straits relationship withdraws from its central importance in the lives of ordinary people. Um, I, I use the phrase, uh, Jinmen gains a certain autonomy from cross-straits relations. Um, but you didn't like that phrase last time because it, 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 you thought it suggested too much agency. It wasn't they were making this decision. But the point is that, that the, the, deal, but the deals between Beijing and Taipei no longer, I want to see if I've, if I've convinced you. I'm not, I'm not calling you out on it. Um, the uh, cross-straits interactions became possible at this time. People began to move back and forth across the straits, but no one would have imagined in the 1990s that cross-straits interaction would have been would have would have would have set, would have become would become central again. That Jinmen would ever be tied back into the economic and social and linguistic and cultural networks that had existed before 1949. Another phenomenon that happens in this second phase is the beginnings of an articulation of a distinctive Jinmen identity. Uh, and these are scenes of uh, various protests that uh, islanders took to Taipei uh, in the 1990s. Um, these articulations of a new Jinmen identity actually beckoned back, gestured back to the first phase. Basically, people on Jinmen were saying, it was our heroic defense of Taiwan it was us as the front line in the battle against the, the, the Gongfei that enabled the success of Taiwan. At the same time, people began to think about a future for the island in which supplying the, in which the military didn't basically um, uh, provide all economic opportunity. Um, what would the villagers of Jinmen do when providing goods and soldiers for, for troops was, could no longer be uh, the, the, the best way to sustain themselves. And they looked at various options in the 1990s. Uh, a large part of the island was converted into a national park. Uh, they tried to promote tourism, a kind of battlefield nostalgia tourism. Um, and then in 2001, the little, three, the little three links are inaugurated. And it becomes clear that Jinmen's future was inseparable from the mainland and inseparable from the larger structure of the cross-straits relationship. So the question then became for the people of Jinmen how to construct that future in the most advantageous ways. Um, Shelley, in her paper yesterday, suggested that one of the questions, a central question that the DPP faced uh, in the late 90s and on into the 21st century was, how do we manage the inevitable rise of China? And in a sense, my paper is about how various actors in Jinmen and the Jinmen area, local governments, regional governments, business interests, ordinary people, NGOs, how did they think about this question? So how to, how to explore this question of how people on Jinmen uh, think about the um, way to build the most advantageous future they can build in light of this inevitable rise of China. I faced a sort of dilemma here because the obvious thing to do was to just look at all of the various forms of integration that are going on, the marriages, uh, uh, the, the uh, um, investment flows, and so on that people on Jinmen are doing. Um, Instead, I'm going to, I'm, I've, I've suggested, uh, the, the paper, uh, I've made a decision in the paper to do something else, which is to look at a series of public debates over the last four or five years, which are debates about what seem to be quite discrete issues on Jinmen. But I think are actually, um, and I owe this to, to Rob's comments at the last session, they're really debates about the nature of Jinmen's integration with Fujian and the mainland. So we're going to look at a couple of debates very, very quickly that are, in a sense, useful, not intellectually useful and interesting, not for their own sake, but because they are kind of a proxy for the way people in Jinmen talk about their future. In these debates, various um, identity claims arise. Right? And people talk about who they are and who the people of Jinmen are in various ways. Um, I am not going to uh, talk about 
whether the people of Jinmen are Taiwanese or Chinese or Hokkienese or whatever. Um, as as uh, Sarah points out in her paper, these are questions that are almost impossible to explore. Uh, what's interesting, and I'm going to sort of follow her lead, what's interesting is how these various identity positions are mobilized. That is to say, how do claims about identity uh, get used in people's political practice? So I'll talk very, very quickly about um, three, uh, three public debates. Um, I should add that one of the things that spurs these, the main thing that spurs these debates is actually the shift in 2008 from the little three links, that is direct ties, direct communication and transport ties between Jinmen and the mainland, the shift from the little three links to the three big links, right? The direct ties between Taiwan and uh, uh, the mainland, which very much threatens the special position that Jinmen had occupied and Mazu as well had occupied for uh, a couple of years in between. So I'm going to look at three, at three debates. One is the debate about uh, the construction of a casino on Jinmen. Um, the, uh, the, um, I'm not going to run through all of the positions in the debate. Um, I've, I've shortened it a lot in the paper, and I'll, I'll shorten it further. I just want to suggest a couple of um, uh, interesting things about each debate, and then I'll step back and, and, and make some, some, broader, uh, some broader concluding remarks. Um, so the idea, of course, of a casino on Jinmen is that uh, this would be a way to uh, extract wealth from the rich people in Xiamen. Uh, and uh, so it's a particular form of, uh, of, 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 of economic integration. Uh, there are many people on Jimin who are strong advocates of a casino because they've been looking for 10 years. I showed you that image of, of the skyline of Xiamen developing. They've been looking at all this money. And they, and they actually, this is one of their political techniques when they, when they, when they talk to Taipei, is they say, look, uh, people in Xiamen are getting rich. Xiamen is, is, is bright lights, big city. Jimin is still dark and quiet. Uh, and restrictions from Taipei are what are what is preventing us from sharing in this wealth. Um, there is though, there are though people on Jimin who say, well, that's very, very dangerous because it makes us basically hostage to uh, interests on the mainland. Right? The day and interests on the mainland that we don't understand. The day the mayor of Xiamen decides to set up his own casino, we're sunk. And then there are also interests, people on Jimin who say, this is very dangerous because um, we will, this is a short-term expedient that will have all of us people on Jinmen uh, washing dishes and serving drinks. That the benefits of this form of integration will uh, uh, not accrue to us, but will accrue to global businesses. Um, a second debate is uh, the question of building a bridge between Jinmen and Xiamen. Um, and there are, there are two debates in one here. The first is a debate, to a, a bridge to Xiamen. The other is a bridge from uh, Big Jimin to Little Jimin. Um, and the, the um, one interesting thing about this, I'll, I'll mention two, two, two brief uh, uh, issues in, the, in, this, in this debate. Um, the central government of the ROC has decided that it will not support the construction of a bridge uh, from uh, uh, Jinmen to Xiamen. Um, the argument is made that it's because it would be too expensive. But the real reason is that if you're going to push forward with deepening integration, you might as well, do the, you, you might as well put your infrastructure, you'll get more bang for your infrastructure buck in Taiwan itself. The people of Jinmen who are in favor of deepening integration so long as it passes through Jinmen, uh, are opposed to the big three links and present various arguments about why that's dangerous and why that's risky and say, well, instead, you should build, you should build the, the little three links and, and you'll get bang for your infrastructure buck this way. Just one other interesting thing about this debate, um, environmental groups are very, very engaged in this debate. Basically, the argument they make uh, and there's a certain justification, is that no one in Jinmen is doing anything about conservation, anything about waste management. 
on the assumption that within a couple of years, they'll be able to dump their garbage on the mainland and get their water from the mainland. And so there's an, the, 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 they are deeply, deeply opposed to the, to the even discussions of the bridge because they're saying this is a way for our, gov our local government to ignore pressing environmental concerns. Third, the third uh, debate is a debate about opening up universities on Jinmen, the, the local technical college was converted to um, uh, a university in August of this year. Um, I'm going to take one 30 extra seconds and tell this extraordinary story of these Hua Chao from Brunei who basically got in a donation bidding war uh, at the opening ceremonies. And the, 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 prince of the president of the university found himself 30 seconds later 5 million US dollars richer because he was able to work these Hua Chao uh, uh, dignitaries into, into, into uh, a kind of uh, um, uh, uh, demonstration of their manliness. Um, the, 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 the real story here is that uh, besides National Jinmen University, 20 Taiwan universities have established satellite campuses on Jinmen to draw in the mainland education market. And the interesting thing about this debate is that it's really tied to uh, the problem of gross oversupply in the Taiwan educational market. Right? There was this huge expansion in Taiwanese higher education, and there just are not enough students. Uh, and Taiwanese universities are anxious to fill the empty seats with mainland students. Jinmen uh, interests are very, very keen to prevent that, right? and to force the, the, to, to maintain the restrictions on mainland students going to Taiwan, having negotiated an exemption to those restrictions for Jinmen. Right? So they want deepening educational integration, but, to use a phrase that came up yesterday. All right. So what do we, I'm just going just gonna to finish off, what do we learn by um, looking at these various debates? What's the, what's the intellectual payoff? Um, I'll suggest three uh, or four, depending on how much time Rob gives me. <laughs> um, the, first <laughs> uh, the first is that um, the uh, uh, people's positions on specific aspects of cross-straits integration uh, are not correlated in any clear way with their positions on the overall cross-strait relationships. The, the quadrant model uh, that Dittmer and, and Wu Shan showed us yesterday is, I think, a very useful heuristic device, but the reality on the ground is much more complex. To give just one clear example, one of the biggest proponents of the casino project on Jinmen is the local head of the DPP. DPP tends to oppose casinos. It's part of their kind of more liberal position, and, and uh, they're also you know, basically opposed to more integration uh, in favor of less. But the head of the DPP on Jinmen is also the head of the local tourist industry. So he wants the, he wants the casino. Um, it makes for very strange, so the, the, the positions are complex. Um, there are, it makes for very strange bedfellows. Um, the ROC army is deeply opposed to the bridge uh, for security reasons. Their leaked reports saying that if we build a bridge, then it's going to take four minutes for the PLA to, to, to take Jinmen. Um, <laughs> those reports were leaked and publicized by the pan-green media right, to show that uh, the Ma government is playing games with Taiwan security. The, 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 the central point is, I think, the one that um, Micah made, which is that positions about specific forms of interaction involve specific agendas on cross-straits relations and typically involve moving interaction to a specific point and then freezing it. Proponents of specific forms of integration are not generally in favor of full-scale integration. They're in favor of the specific forms that suit their interests and no more. Um, I won't talk about uh, identity claims, although I will say that when, when th there is a whole identity dimension to this argument. Uh, when staking positions, people make identity claims. They claim to be uh, model Taiwanese citizens. They claim to be uh, uh, Hokkien bridge builders. Um, it's not in any way to diminish the authenticity of identity claims. 
uh, to point out that strategic interests can shape identity as much as identity can shape strategic interests. Um, the, one of the questions that people have, um, okay. one of the questions that people have been putting to me since I proposed this chapter is the relationship between Jinmen and Taiwan. This is a curious kind of case study in the sense that Jinmen is not like Taiwan in many ways. It can't stand in for Taiwan. But I think that if we think broadly, people on Taiwan are also, excuse me, making choices about cross-straits interactions. They are also engaging in a kind of strategic self-positioning in support of certain cross-straits agendas. And that these uh, positionings reflect a much messier social and political reality on the ground. A lasting cross-strait settlement will have to take this messiness into account. Thank you. Thanks, Bro. Micah and Michael. Uh, we don't have a discussion, and therefore I want to abuse the chair a little bit. I, I'm, not the dis I'm not being the substitute discussant. I didn't know there wouldn't be a discussant. But the papers together kind of generated a wandering thought that I thought I would wander in public <laughs> with a little bit. Um, I want to start with the idea of horizons, I suppose we're calling them, but what I mean is boundaries, and end up with identity. Um, because I think these papers give us a rather different impression than the whole day yesterday gave us. So boundaries, you know, how do we imagine boundaries? And in particular, how do we imagine the boundaries around a place, a country, a political entity, whatever euphemisms we're using for the particular case at hand here? Um, we have in China studies for a long time um, thought about a distinction between a maritime China and a continental China, right? So a, a China, a, a China, the big continental place with a boundary of some sort around it, um, an imperial boundary, which is a rather different sort of thing, right? So a boundary that faded out from a, a center uh, in, into a, uh, like concentric rings of different kinds of tributary relations into barbarity at the edge. So rather than a strict line the way we have now, uh, a kind of fading out of civilization into some place that ultimately wasn't China. Um, and then we have, in the Chinese case, starting in the 19th century, sometime toward the end, an idea of nation state that China simply couldn't escape because the world by then was set up as a world of nation states and China really had no choice but to join it. Uh, it's worth pointing out, I think as someone mentioned yesterday, or maybe it was a, a, a meal conversation, um, Taiwan kind of missed a lot of that history, right? Taiwan's a colony of Japan at much of the time when the idea of China as a nation with an identity is developing on the mainland. So we have those visions of a continental China, but we also have this other China, a China that's open and undefined and opportunistic, right? The China, well, we, we call this maritime China, though the term really needs to be taken apart to some extent. There's a kind of southern maritime China and there's a northern maritime China. And we might want to look west in China, too, at the kind of openness you get at borders and the way people can cross the borders and manipulate the borders and manipulate the identities at the borders um, that we get maybe, maybe all around China. So what's striking about today's vision, I think in comparison to most of yesterday's vision, is those hard boundaries of nation states don't loom very large at all. They're almost erased uh, in different ways in, in, the, in the two cases. I mean, in a sense, it's because they exist or because the weird relationship between Taiwan and China exists that you can get smuggling, right? And as trade became much easier and straightforward, smuggling, I gather, has declined a lot. So that it's not that the nation state issue is irrelevant. Um, Nevertheless, these are guys not worrying about China or Taiwan. They're worrying about the price of fish and gold bars or lead bars disguised as gold bars or right, all, all these sets of issues that Micah's paper uh, touches on. And Mike Gull's paper 
Also, obviously, the national boundary is a very important thing here, but what we have is a bunch of people trying to find a place, an economic place, mostly by manipulating everything they can to make it work. So somehow DPP and KMT play out in ways utterly unexpected from the point of view of Taiwan proper. Uh, right? The whole set of arguments seem rather differently calculated completely in that case. So we have, you know, where's identity? So the real question here for me from from listening to the two papers is, what happened to identity? Yesterday, how many of the papers yesterday used more or less the same data to chart that, you know, are you Chinese, are you Taiwanese, are you both Chinese and Taiwanese? That was such an important piece of so many of the papers yesterday. And here, it doesn't even make sense to ask the questions. Identity becomes this totally, either totally irrelevant kind of thing. In Micah's paper, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with anything. And in Michael's paper, it, it's utterly negotiable. Um, that's a really different view of identity. And I have to say, as an anthropologist now, that those charts yesterday, those make us really nervous. I mean, it's way better now than when they only said, are you Chinese or are you Taiwanese? At least there's the both question, gets a little bit more at the flexibility of identity. But in in asking the question, you're assuming identity is a set thing that one has. That is the nation state view of identity, right? It is a nation and state, right? It's those ideas combined that somehow we're all the same. We all share an identity. That's what makes us Chinese. That's the nation state idea, a kind of hard identity that we have. And that's what polls like all those ones being used yesterday assume. Anthropologists tend to understand identity as a rhetorical position or maybe even a cognitive position, but it's a, it's a set of possibilities that are out there which are put together in certain ways at, at certain times in certain contexts. And that's much more like today, a sort of soft identity, a soft identity that you'd expect much more in a maritime, if I can use that term really broadly, but meaning these very flexible uh, kinds of arrangements that we saw that we saw today. So it, you know, really about soft identity. So it was that I, I simply wanted to share this idea that you know, nation state and hard identity, this maritime view and soft identity probably go together. And, the, and you know, there's maybe even farther we can push this argument for the, uh, for the book itself. And then finally, as a question, maybe more to Michael than Micah, but that comes out of this, identity at, at this point in the papers, especially Michael's paper, becomes really just um, um, a, a tool in pursuing economic interests. So what we have is a human life driven by economic interests where identity is just simply a, a rhetorical position you can take when it's convenient for you. Is that really the view of history? Well, is that really your view <laughs> of history? And you know, although Micah's paper doesn't do this as explicitly, to some extent, I think we, we also just see people driven by economic calculation. Um, and uh, coming from historians, and you two historians in particular, I thought that was an interesting position for you to have taken. So I'll shut up now, except just to call on people. Yeah, this one. Thanks. I have a comment that's related to Professor Weller's comments about um, flexible identity. And one interesting comparison that comes to mind is Australia and New Zealand. And as I understand, Australia's constitution has a clause uh, that says, New Zealand, if you'd ever like to join us, you're more than welcome to. And um, <laughs> apparently, that the US has allowed one has something for. about Canada like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Apparently, that's allowed for some flexibility in regards to labor. So for seasons, I know there's there's a bit of, um, of influx from Australia and New Zealand um, going back and forth. And and um, the folks that I know in New Zealand and Australia are retirees, so they, they talk about um, health benefits and retirement benefits. And there's some sort of um, agreement as to how that works out when you are an Australian, New Zealand, uh, Australian citizen living in New Zealand and vice versa. Um, and it seems sort of interesting because um, similar sh sort of shared history and language um, and it's sort kind of like a cross-trace relationship. So I, I just thought that was an interesting comparison to throw out. Um, not, not really a question. That if, if there is a question, I was wondering if that has ever come up in um, talking about cross-trace relationships because it's, it's a bit of a, the inverse in which um, two separate sovereign nations see itself as having a tie that 
that is not formally written down. Thank you. I think if you guys don't mind, I'm going to collect two or three questions and then let you respond as you wish, and then we'll see what time it is. Yisha. Um, I would like to um, make a comment on uh, Michael's paper. And you mentioned that probably the reality on the ground is a little bit more complicated than a model would suggest. And I would uh, impose a strategic triangle model <laughs> on, on what you have just said, namely the situation in Jinmen. Um, in a strategic triangle, an actor would like to uh, have a position of a pivot, namely to tilt to one side in order to gain uh, concessions from the other side. So they would be tilt and counter tilt and so on and so forth. And this actor would not want to see the other two actors in serious conflict because they don't, he, he doesn't want to be, get dragged into their warfare, whatever. But it, neither would it want the other two actors to have too close relationship because in that case, it won't be able to benefit from their conflict. So now let's put Jim Man into this position. It's exactly the same. Jim Man, um, after democratization and local election, etc., has gained a position of like semi-autonomy from Taiwan. And it is tilting between the mainland and Taiwan in order to gain uh, concessions from both sides. Probably water from the mainland and dumped. Um, waste to the mainland and also less restrictions from Taiwan and bridge uh, commitment from Taiwan, which mind you just uh, made for the, uh, the the bridge between the uh, Da Jinmen and Xiao Jinmen. And Jinmen doesn't want uh, Taiwan and mainland China to have warfare because otherwise it would have to be forced back into a garrison uh, situation. As during the Cold War, it doesn't want the two sides to have too warm relationship. Otherwise, Jim would lose his special position. So Jim Man acts precisely according to the predictions of a strategic triangle. I would like to see your response to that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no other hands at the moment, let me one shin, one shin, and then a after this. Let me give you two guys a chance to respond, and we'll see what time it is. Well, mine is uh, also along the line of uh, a comment, and in some ways, um, follow following up on uh, Rob's point. Um, I find it very interesting. Um, again, the contrast. Um, or the way that issues are conceptualized yesterday versus the way that issues um, are conceptualized today. Um, on the whole, uh, I see in three papers, uh, Bill Kirby's, uh, Micah's, and Michael's, these three papers as papers dealing with um, a shared um, question, which is about the impact over of uh, overall general policies adopted by the state on specific actors, localities, and so forth within a certain bounded context. Now, yesterday, Dr. Su made the point about how that if Taiwan were situated somewhere else, then it would have a completely different set of strategic considerations or issues to uh, wake him up in the middle of the night. Um, in, um, in the three papers that we have here, I read uh, Bill's paper as a paper on the broader question of how changes in state policies would affect the decisions being made by a globalizing, internationalizing, Taiwan-based company. And then in Micah's case, even though Micah is not exactly trying to talk about transnationals. Nonetheless, it's very interesting and very telling that smuggling would thrive under given circumstances only and not some other situations. In other words, there are local dynamics as well as um, local dynamics intersecting with state policies with regard to the distribution of advantage or disadvantage of um, local interest. 
And Yu Shan just put it、um, in the most compelling and interesting way about the way that the strategic triangle perspective might contribute to、um, another take on Jin Men's position. So I suppose with all of that,、um, all of these um, um, these uh, papers moving in that direction, the one question that would come to my mind. That is reading the historians' papers and listening to political scientists' analysis. The one question there that would seem to arise rather naturally is the question of、uh, the decision-making process with regard to mainland policies, and the way that such policy making would take into account the distribution or redistribution of interest in. Specific locales and within local communities. Now, I understand that this is not quite yet democratization, since national security is hardly something to be、uh, calculated or calibrated in ways、uh, that would speak to uh, issues of、um, uh, what the specificities with regard to distributions of local interest. But nonetheless, I would like to raise that as a question. Thanks. So why don't、um, we do Micah first? Just go in order, and then Michael. Why don't you go first? Because I really. <laughs> They, you actually have questions to answer. All right.、Yeah. Um, well, Rob,、uh, you noticed something that I noticed but shied away from addressing.、Um, Directly in the in the paper,、um, the 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 approach began as a research strategy. That is to say, I looked at what people were saying about who they were, and realized that did not tell me what their identity was. So it, I began the I, but but that then implies a kind of intellectual position, as you say, that identity is simply a rhetorical tool in in service of. Homo economicus, and, and I, I, I'm not happy with that. But I don't know.、Um, I don't know quite what to do with it.、Um, I mean, the, 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 the easy way out is simply to say what I just said, right? That we we actually can't know、um, what people think they are. We only.、Um, uh, I mean, I think it is worthwhile、um, because that you see that chart so much. I think it's worthwhile suggesting that there may be a problem with that chart.、Um, as you, you, Shelley, you articulated last time, the question that ought to be asked in these polls is, with respect to this particular issue, are you Chinese or are you Taiwanese?、Um, so I, 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 you're quite right. I, I don't really see a way out, and I would welcome advice. Do you, do you spend time、um, explaining、uh, what, where the DPP position comes from on Jin Men? I mean, that seems to me to be a potentially a, a useful way of, of, of talking about some of this. Who are the DPP people on Jin Men, and what does it mean to be part of the DPP there versus、uh, on mainland Taiwan? If you can speak、yeah. that way, I, I think it's a really curious、um, position because of what Jin Men has been historically, and that might just. Start to unpack this a little bit. But I met some、uh, of those people with you. Yeah, I but it. Understand exactly what their politics is and what they're trying to, why they come to that position. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting. I don't want to take too long on this on a basically an empirical point. It's a really really interesting one because of the, the DPP quite famously in about 1995 offered to give Jinmen back、uh, to the mainland. Um, which means that the green vote is not very big on Jinmen.、Um, the but they it, there, so I'll mention just three things very briefly.、Um, the the first is that issue. The other is that um, the um, because people on Jinmen were very unhappy about author the the even greater level of authoritarian control in the 80s. They were part of the Danglai. And they then became part of some of the dissidents on Jinmen became part of the DPP because of that original oppositional history.、Um, even though they shared basically nothing in common, 
with their counterparts except opposition, a, a desire for reform. Um, and then the other interesting thing is the, f the founder of the, of the actual party, the party branch, um, uh, said to me, we knew what was coming and we knew we couldn't be shut out of Taipei. So with tears in my eyes, I signed the, the document establishing the DPP on Jinmen. Uh, it's a really interesting story. I don't know that it's maybe distracting from the larger questions, but I, appreciate, I think you're right. It, it does go some way, except that the whole paper in some ways is saying that party positions don't tell you what you need to know here. Um, let me turn to the strategic triangle. That's, I'm convinced. Um, but, but, um, so the real, the real issue that people have asked me repeatedly in these gatherings is um, whether this tells us anything about anywhere other than Jinmen. And I think it does because many of these complexities are true of divisions within Taiwan society. So if, if, the, if the strategic triangle, I mean, I think the strategic triangle probably could be adapted to explain uh, Taipei, Beijing, and southern Taiwan, right? Also Taipei, Beijing, or ROC, PRC, and uh, commercial interests in Taipei. Right? In each case, and, and that's really, I think that, that is where the significance of the paper is. And the interesting thing is that, of course, well, I don't know IR theory, but presumably the strategic triangle depends on three discrete entities. And what I'm suggesting is that one pole in the triangle is actually part of another pole in the triangle. And that creates an interesting complexity. Would you, would you accept my position that if you're going to say there's a strategic triangle here, there's multiple strategic triangles, which I think actually gets to uh, Ye Wenxin's question. All right, the question is, how does Taiwan negotiate the fact that it contains so many other poles in a strategic triangle? Layers. It's layers, yeah. Layers <laughs> it's fractal. <laughs> well, is this... My, okay. Uh, I mean, with regards to the identity issue, this is something that I, I think much like Michael, hesitated to engage with for a variety of reasons, mainly because I tend to be something of an agnostic when it comes to what people's identity actually is, actually is in the sense that they're very difficult to get at but more importantly, they're fluid within limits and contingent. So I think that trying one of the problems as a historian that we have, I think, with the graph of identity, in, in, in addition to the fact that it conceals all these other more nuanced identities that people can, uh, uh, can hold, is that all of these things are in flux. They're in a constant state of flux. And so 2001, two, three is not necessarily the best way to gauge the temporal dimension of identity in the sense that in certain contexts, people can deploy identity in a variety of different ways. And so, what I've, and given that complexity and the nature of the sources that I've been working with, I'm, you know, I'm not, I haven't done a, a sort of deep ethnography of these, of these places. It's difficult for me to say actually how identity comes into play beyond just what people say at a specific moment in time. But identity does come in in a kind of interesting way in this paper in that these people on Taiwan who are smuggling and doing very sort of Taiwanese things, right? I mean, going out in boats and, you know, trading various sorts of things with, with mainland China and all these other places and communicating with people in, in Fujian dialect and what have you, they actually claim to be more 
Chinese and more tied to the mainland at the time when the ROC was still claiming to be the government of all of China while also prohibiting direct trade with the mainland. So there are quotes that say, well, don't you say that this is all, you know, all part of China? And don't you say that we're going to, we have to help our, our, you know, Tongbao on the mainland? Well, look, we trade with them and they make money and we make money. And so how can you say that we're doing something wrong? Right. And so people are, who are, it, it, I, I, I seriously am hesitant to accept this sort of purely economic model of people's behavior, but to a certain extent, and I don't think it's the only variable that can explain this flexibility, is that you know people do, in fact, shift their identity, and identities do, in fact, get deployed in different ways depending on different sorts of circumstances. And I think that I think what our papers show is that in certain certain instances, not all instances, economic interest is important in the way that people deploy identity. And we're not saying it's the only thing, but we're looking at economic behavior. So I think that it's actually, I think that in some ways there's a, a problem of re reverse causation. Because we're looking at economic behavior, that's the, I think that's the, one of the main themes in these papers. We look at the way in which identity gets deployed for economic ends, which is just the tip of the iceberg, right? So um, it's a, it's a very tricky question, and um, I think that just grasping the complexity of these things beyond these charts really is something worth taking notice of. I didn't notice we were out of time. Just, just very quickly, one thing that strikes me, and I don't, I don't think we're the people to develop this theme, but your, 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 quote, your comment about help being, helping the, the Naruto Tombao, mm -hmm. um, People say that Chinese culture is without irony. The ironic, the ironic use of identity claims runs through the way Jimin people talk about their identity and has uh, since, since, certainly since I've been working there. Be a, I think that would actually be a very interesting, a study of the ironic working of identity um, would be an, an interesting subject and, and shows that it's not just about making money. Thank you. Let's thank uh, both of our speakers. It was a great session.